Today's video was recorded on July 26, 2022, and this is the third lesson in our series on the Transfiguration. In today's lesson, we'll connect the Transfiguration event all the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden before their sin. And we'll see in both Jewish and early Christian writings, we find the idea that Adam and Eve were beings of light. And we'll look at a number of these examples to help us understand that way of thinking. But more importantly though, we're going to examine what that means about us in our spiritual growth journey in Christ Jesus. What does Paul want us to do in response to the glory of Adam being restored by Jesus? Just a few logistical items before we begin the lesson. We try to provide a class handout for each lesson as best we can. And this helps you keep your thoughts organized, take any notes as things come to mind, and more importantly, since we're looking at a number of extra-biblical writings, I include all of those details to help you with your studies. So make sure you click the link below in the description section that will take you to the class handout. Additionally, if you haven't already subscribed to our YouTube channel, make sure you subscribe by clicking that red subscribe button below. You can also find our lessons on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Both of those offer a great way to take the study with you and listen while you're doing the dishes or mowing the lawn or on your way to and from work. And then finally, one way you can support our ministry is through the Smile.Amazon program, which is part of the Amazon Foundation. So the Amazon Foundation will donate on your behalf each quarter to Fig Tree Ministries when you shop using smile.amazon.com. And if you're not using smile.amazon, you should make sure you're doing so. Not using it when you shop leaves donations on the table for the many nonprofit organizations that would be helped by them. So make sure you always shop with smile.amazon.com and select Fig Tree Ministries as your donation partner. Now we included a link that will take you directly to smile.amazon and it'll be attached to Fig Tree Ministries. You can find that in the description section of all of our videos and podcasts and it makes it easy to find us. So we hope you enjoy part three of the background of the transfiguration of Jesus and how we can connect it back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and also see how it helps direct our spiritual growth path today in our personal walk with Jesus. Let us begin tonight. This is the third in our series on the Transfiguration, trying to understand the foundational pieces that go into the Transfiguration and then what it tells us. God willing, we build that foundation around it, meaning then what's the meaning of the Transfiguration can rise out of it once we see the pieces laying there. So this lesson tonight is going to be titled Beings of Light. Now, God willing, by the end of this, you'll understand why I'm titling that. Because the transfiguration reveals to us something about the nature of reality that we can't see with our physical eyes, but we can see or the disciples see at the top of the mountain there in a revelation. And what it is is a revelation of the reality of who Jesus is. Okay, so for our background picture, another transfiguration painting. Of course, the artists love this because it gives them the freedom to express what's in their mind, how they see the transfiguration. And so this is an Italian painter. Somewhere in between 1567 to 1573, and so this painting is by Latanzio Gambara. All right, so we'll use that as our background painting. Now, what we've done over the first two weeks, and this is what I'm working off of, is what we would call a mind map. And a mind map is not just a list of things, but a artistic representation. And so what I chose for that artistic representation is within the spiritual growth community, they talk about spiritual growth as being like a chambered nautilus. That's a little sea creature. So our map here spirals just like a chambered nautilus 
because you simply can't, it's nonlinear. We're trying to understand the aspects of the transfiguration, but it's not a straight line. So it's just like a, the curvature of poetry that brings you around to help you understand what's going on. Now, last week, we looked at Exodus 30, or I'm sorry, Exodus 24. That's Moses and three named disciples ascending the mountain to see God. And we talked about Exodus 34. That's Moses coming down off the mountain, and he had his own transfiguration experience where he's radiating light. And then we looked a little bit at rabbinic thought about Moses and radiating light. And all of that, again, part of the goal here is to understand by the time the first century comes around, the disciples and that first century audience, what would they be thinking? And of course, the Exodus story lives large in their mind. Moses is the hero for first century Judaism. So they look back to those stories, and it helps us understand what Jesus is up to in, as being the Redeemer, but ultimately one greater than Moses who redeems all of Israel. That's what we did last week. Now, another way, if we want to represent this idea, is just like a mountain. So the transfiguration happens at the top of that mountain. Mountains are representative of spiritual journeys because every level you go higher, your ability to see, your perspective changes. That's what happens on a spiritual journey. And so imagine if we want to climb that mountain and the we need to lay the foundation so that we have stability. And we'll get to, in a couple of weeks, two of the main pieces of this foundation, Psalm 42 and 43. And then there's a midrash around that. Last week, we looked at Exodus 24 and Exodus 34. We're adding in each week rabbinic thought that helps us understand the Hebrew mindset of the way that you read the text, and then extra biblical writing, which influences the way those in the first century saw the text or understood something about the text. So all of that goes into then us understanding what is there at the peak, which is the transfiguration. By way of preview tonight, we'll do a little bit more on this idea of the heavenly righteous. What do the, the righteous look like in heaven? And then bring that, of course, into our present reality. We're going to look at one second temple period writing called First Enoch, and the book of Enoch, and see what Enoch says, because this was a very popular book. And then we're going to connect that and the transfiguration to a um, theological idea that has to do with the first, this is a Jewish theological idea that has to do with the first Adam and the last Adam, which is the Messiah. So heavenly righteous, first Enoch, connect that to first Adam, last Adam, and all of this helps us understand the transfiguration. Now, in order to get started this week, what I want to do is look at the transfiguration story, but look at a different one. Last week we read Mark. This week I want to read Matthew. So if you have your Bible, or you want to stop the video or pause the recording, grab your Bible, and you can read along Matthew 17, and it's verses 1 through 8, and we'll read just a little bit different detail. So Matthew, for his audience, he's going to include a few details that Mark didn't. And this is Matthew 17, 1 to 8. And let's read along here as the text says, After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Now, here's we've seen part of our emphasis here is what is happening. Face shone like the sun. Clothes became white as light. And that'll enter our uh, topic tonight. All right, let's keep going. 
verses now verse 4 Peter says to Jesus Lord it is good for us to be here if you wish I will put up three shelters one for you one for Moses one for Elijah while he was still speaking a bright cloud covered them and a voice from the cloud said this is my son whom I love with him I am well pleased listen to him verse 6 when the disciples heard this they fell face down to the ground terrified but jesus came and touched them get up he said don't be afraid when they looked up they saw no one except jesus all right so there's a little bit different uh version of the story from matthew and we're not again this this study is not an attempt to compare the three different tellings and why there are some variations in them, but I want you to hear at least one uh, version that's different. And every time you hear the story, if you've been following along and you've been reading them over and over and over, some things should start to then jump out as you hear the explanation that's going on from what's going on behind it. So hopefully that's helping uh, that's working for you and that's helping you see something a little bit deeper in the text. Okay, let's talk about the heavenly righteous. So this is what we've done really the past few weeks, um, discussing what, it, what this means, the heavenly righteous, and what do the righteous look like in heaven. And if we remember last week, Jesus even says in Matthew uh, 13, He says, the righteous will shine like the stars. And what we've been doing is we've been looking at writings that come from outside the Bible to help us understand a couple things. This is really important and something that I feel, at least within Protestant faith, and that's the part of that's the faith tradition I'm from, is we're missing. A lot of these extra writings, because some of them are in the Catholic Bible, and we're just not aware. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a minute. But it's something that I think is really important for people to understand. First of all, and this is number one here, we need to understand there's a progression of thought from the Old Testament to the New. Okay, there's a period of time where these extra biblical writings are really an attempt to understand the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and uh, the development of ideas that come out of that, that when they get to the New Testament, they're taken as everybody believes this, like the resurrection is one of them that does that. The second part is for us to understand the culture of the first century. There is a ton of cultural references in the New Testament that are never explained. The way you would know that, just like in our day when we read something from our from today in 2022, we understand the cultural references because we live in the culture. But we don't always understand the cultural references from the first century in Israel or in uh, the gospel audience. So what would they have thought? What would the first hearers or readers of the gospel understand about the transfiguration story? You know, part of that is Jesus is revealing his true nature, the righteous, the heavenly righteous, and the future reality of God's cosmos. So what I want to do right now is do a little bit on this idea of the extra biblical writings in a timeline, and hopefully that will help you be able to think about this idea, and then we'll look at one of those extra biblical writings and talk about the heavenly righteous. Okay, so if we take a look at a timeline here, we have the Old Testament, and then I'm going to put the end of this period somewhere around 100 AD. And the ending of the Old Testament uh, is the book of Chronicles. And so that's written after they come back from captivity and the, the rebuilding of the Second Temple, Ezra and Nehemiah. And so you have Old Testament is ending the writing around 450 BC. 
then I'm going to take the New Testament time, or I'm going to take this period of time all the way out to 100 AD, because that's about when Revelation is taking place. So what we see here is that's 500 years in between that time, 500 plus. And it's 500 plus years that's full of turmoil. It's rebuilding the second temple. It's uh, persecution from foreign governments. It's being ruled by the Persians. And it's not the Persians, then it's the Greeks. And if it's not the Greeks, then it's the Romans. And so the Jewish people in Israel and throughout the diaspora, because many Jews stayed in Babylon, are wrestling with what is now becoming, uh, in, through that canonization process of their own, what's becoming their sacred text. And that now includes the prophets, because they just they had the prophets talking about what happened in exile, and the book of Chronicles. And that's coming together to form what they understand to be their sacred text. And now they're going to wrestle with that. How do we understand these sacred texts? How do we live out what God wants us to do? We have it, either we live among the pagan nations or we're surrounded by the pagan nations. But it's, it is tremendous wrestling with how do we maintain our Jewish identity as the world is being Hellenized by the Greeks? And that's a real struggle. So this is what they're wrestling with. And then into that, very late into the period, we see Jesus show up, somewhere 30 AD, we'll call it. So his ministry is showing, showing up late in that period. And then what we get somewhere between 50 and 90 AD is we see the Apostle Paul, the Gospels are being written, finally the stories that from Jesus' time are being written down and disseminated, and then the book of Revelation towards the end of that first century. Now, what helps us understand the context of, of all of this and the culture of that time are going to be the extra biblical writings. And so there is a huge uh, library of extra biblical writings that come out of that Eastern Mediterranean uh, Jewish thinking, not always written in Hebrew, uh, often written in Greek. But let me go walk through a couple of these with you to help you understand uh, what's out there. Now, the first group that I'll put on there is called the Apocrypha. Now, it covers a significant amount of, uh, of time. You will find this in your Catholic Bible. Well, not your, maybe not your Catholic Bible, but hey, if you have a Catholic friend that has a Bible, ask to look at theirs, um, or you can go out and purchase one. I would recommend getting a, uh, a Bible with the Apocrypha included. You can find those on Amazon. That Apocrypha is going to be very helpful for you to understand the history of what's taking place between the Old Testament and the New. And you know, the King James, the King James Version of the Bible used to print the Apocrypha all the way up until the late 1800s. So if it was 1822 instead of 2022, and you purchased your King James Bible, it had the Apocrypha in the back, and they stopped doing that. And I think that that actually, uh, hurts us rather than helps us. So check out the Apocrypha. There's a whole another group of writings that are called the Pseudepigrapha. They're written under a pseudonym, like we'll look at one tonight, First Enoch. Well, Enoch, they're taking the name from the character in Genesis, but it's clearly not him writing it. Uh, you'll have like the Assumption of Moses. It's not really Moses writing it. So they use a pseudonym to tell their story, but the author is anonymous. So the pseudepigrapha. You have now, we're all aware of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the Dead Sea Scrolls found just to the north east of Jerusalem in the desert. And what's really cool about the Dead Sea Scrolls is they're written in Hebrew. And many people had, scholars had said, no, Hebrew was a dead language. They didn't use it. They didn't, Jesus wouldn't have known it. And now they say, no, it's probably not true. Jesus in religious circles probably spoke and wrote in Hebrew. So we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. They retell the stories of the Bible from their own perspective. Okay, so tonight we're going to look at one 
uh, a verse from a book a writing called First Enoch, probably around 200 BC or a little bit earlier. And Enoch is an apocalyptic story. Apocalypse meaning revelation. Uh, Enoch is having heaven revealed to him. That's the revelation. What he normally doesn't see, he's now getting a tour of heaven. So it's a heavenly journey. Um, another thing, another place where we get uh, common thinking or biblical, how Jews thought about biblical stories, there were two prominent writers, Jewish writers from the first century. Philo lived in Alexandria, Egypt, and Josephus who eventually wrote for the Romans. And then the past two weeks, uh, I've talked about the Apocalypse of Baruch, and then in a later time, there's one called Four Ezra. My point is this, there's a ton going on. And what we need to understand is, how did the thinking from that Old Testament travel through 400 years before getting to that first century audience that Jesus is talking about? We barely even mentioned Rome in all of this. And the influence that that had on the Jews there in Israel and, say, the zealots. So, really important when you get to a story like the Transfiguration, because it's so enigmatic, uh, that we need to understand everything that's going around the text being written. All right, so hopefully that helps a little bit. And, and I do, I always encourage people to check some of these out because they really can be helpful to build your uh, understanding of what was going on in that New Testament time. So let's look at one. This is going to be from First Enoch. And the whole point of me getting to this is to show you an idea that comes from around 250, well, probably earlier, but it was written down somewhere around 250, 200 BC. And Enoch, uh, again, is an apocalypse. It's a revelation of, of what heaven is like. Uh, so that would have influenced their thinking about this. And one thing about the book of Enoch is there's... Uh, there's a strong emphasis on the righteous versus the wicked, the punishment and judgment of the wicked, and a Messiah-like figure in the heavens, a judge that's going to sit in judgment of, well, we see that in Revelation. That's, that's a, it's the same type of thinking. Jesus is the judge that sits in heaven and judges the nations, divides the righteous from the wicked. So those all reflect common thought, which is all being derived, of course, from their sacred scriptures. So, first Enoch, and this is uh, just one example from Enoch, there are many. So it says, the righteous and elect shall rise from the earth and shall cease being of downcast face. They shall wear the garments of glory. Now, this is going to be really important tonight. We're going to see this with Adam. They shall wear the garments of glory. These garments of yours shall become the garments of life from the Lord of the spirits. Garments of life. Hmm. Neither shall your garments wear out nor your glory come to an end before the Lord of spirits. So, uh, again, just giving you one simple picture of a very popular book. This was also a very popular book with early church leaders, uh, some of whom thought it should have been part of the canon. So, this book really influences the thinking of the people around that time. And again, what their vision is. What are the garments of glory? We're going to see that in a minute. So, that's just one place you can go check out. I hope this helps give you a little bit of a window into some of that, that uh, literature. But it is important for us to understand what's going on during that time. Okay, so that leads us to this. There's a development of thought going on within Judaism, and Paul's going to reflect this in his writing. He's not making something up. This is something that's going to come out of Jewish thinking, and it has to do with uh, the first Adam versus the last Adam. Now, the first Adam, of course, is from Genesis, the one that sinned. The last Adam is the Messiah, the Redeemer. He's the one who's going to restore everything that Adam lost. And that, of course, is Jesus. So the main source for this is 1 Corinthians 15. I'll show you that in a minute. But what we're going to see tonight through the whole thing, and this is going to be how we can connect this to the transfiguration, is that the glory that Adam lost through his sin in the garden as the first Adam, 
is then going to be on display in Jesus during that transfiguration. Okay, because the Messiah is going to restore the glory that Adam, the first Adam, lost. That's why he's the last Adam. All right, so let's look at the scripture here. It's 1 Corinthians 15. I put verse 44b because I'm only going to use the second half of verse 44 and then through 49. So let's see what it says. Paul says, If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, a life giving spirit. So, right there, you can see Paul's use. First Adam here, last Adam, the life giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. Verse 47 The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have been born the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. And then we notice, right, the whole way Paul is comparing these two. The first man was from the dust. The second man is from heaven. And he's got this comparison. And when he's writing this to the Corinthians, right? You know, he doesn't stop to explain it. So what does he assume about his audience? His audience understands the context. They don't say, wait a minute, what is this new thing you're talking about? It's something that they would understand. The Jews who live there in Corinth would understand something about first Adam, uh, last Adam. So he doesn't need to explain it. Okay. So first man, second man, and then this is so critical to what Paul's saying about us. We shall bear the image of the heavenly man. So yes, we bear the image of Adam in our physical bodies and in our, the DNA that stretches back to him and the sin that comes out of that. But we also in Jesus, bear the image of the heavenly man. And that's what Paul wants us to focus on. Our vision to go forward is the heavenly man. So, first Adam, last Adam. Really important. And this exists within the Judaism of Jesus' day and Paul's day. Now, what we're going to do then is take our main, the, the, the title of our lesson tonight, Beings of Light, and we're going to connect that to the transfiguration. Okay? Because that's what the first man, last man, and the transfiguration has to do with. The beings of light. Within Jewish and Christian thinking, early Christian, and it's obviously probably influenced by the Jews around them, in Jewish writing and in Christian writing, there was the thought that Adam and Eve were luminous beings, perhaps even like translucent. But they were clothed, their garments, they were covered in a way, they were covered in God's glory. And so therefore, they're, if they're like a translucent being covered in God's glory, then it shows up as luminous, as, as light, shining power to be covered in the glory of God. Okay, now, let's, now let me just say it again, from both Jewish and Christian, and let me, I'm going to show you some examples, and these are all on your handout, so you'd know where to look later, but these are really important, because we don't always, our artwork doesn't depict Adam that way, and so we don't always think of Adam that way, but I'll show you why they do. Okay, so first one, let me go to the rabbis first. I'll show you one example from the rabbis. This is from a writing called Genesis Rabbah. They're commenting on the book of Genesis, of course. And it says, This refers to Adam's garments, which were like a torch. Now, Adam's garments. We're going to talk about there's a, a garment of glory, and they were like a torch. And then, then they have here shedding radiance. Okay? so. He is clothed literally with the glory of God, garments of light, like a torch. 
And then what you see is once he sins, that goes away. And now uh, in Genesis, God covers them with garments of skin. So there was a change, right? And where did we just, what did we just hear in Enoch? In Enoch, the righteous will have garments of glory. And then last week, what did we hear about Moses, right? Moses was shedding radiant. He was radiating light. So this uh, rabbinic thought is not coming out of just nowhere. They're looking deeper into the Bible than we do. So uh, Genesis Rabbah, that's one. Next, Leviticus Rabbah, 22. The apple of Adam's heel outshone the globe of the sun. How much more so the brightness of his face. So they were using, hey, his heel outshines the sun. That's his, the glorious nature of Adam. And then he used, they, they use a technique here, how much more. You'll find that all over Paul's writings. How much more. It's a rabbinic technique. His face then must have been radiating light. Moses radiates light. Jesus radiates light. So this is the way they thought about Adam as radiating light. Now, let me go to another one. This is a Jewish later writing called the Apocalypse of Moses. Now, remember the word apocalypse is a revelation. It's a revealing of the true nature of things. And the Apocalypse of Moses is now talking about Adam. And it says, And I bent down the branch to the ground, and I took the fruit, and I ate. And in that very hour, my eyes were opened, and I knew that I was stripped of the righteousness which I had been clothed. That's key. Stripped of the right, because this is what they thought. Ah, they radiate the glory of God, the righteousness of God. That's what they're clothed in. And the moment you sin, it goes away. And then it continues on. So he says, I wept, saying, This has been done to me because I have been deprived of the glory which I was clothed. That's the common thinking, clothed in God's glory. Let me show you one more. Uh, this is from a Christian writer. This is a writer called Ephraim the Syrian. Okay? And he's making a comment on Genesis 2.14. And he also notes, it was because of the glory which they were clothed, that's they're clothed in God's glory, that they were not ashamed. It was when this glory was stripped from them after they had transgressed the commandment that they were ashamed because they were naked. So notice what's happening. They radiate the glory of God. So they're like a translucent being radiating the glory of God. That's what they're clothed with, the glory of God. But when they sin, that goes away. And then God's going to shift and he's going to cover them in skin. Okay? Now, let me show you something. This is from, this is going to be from, many of you have probably seen this movie. When they made the movie Noah in 2014, this is how they depicted Adam and Eve. What are they depicted as? Translucent beings who radiate light. And it's radiating, what they're showing is the radiating of God's glory. Now, this, there were Christians at the time, Christian leaders or church leaders, they were up in arms over this depiction. They were, you know, how dare you? That doesn't look like the Adam and Eve that I've seen in artwork. And of course, the filmmaker did his homework. He said, well, how did they, how did the ancient people depict Adam and Eve? And remember, it's both Jewish and Christian that prior to that fall, they're translucent beings radiating God's glory. So, they're like beings of light until the fall, all right? They lost their light. So, we go back to this first Adam, last Adam. So, the first Adam prior to the fall is radiating God's glory. But the glory was lost when he sinned. And so what's going to happen when the last Adam, the Redeemer, the one who will redeem everything for everybody, the Messiah, it's Jesus, what happens when he shows up? What's he going to restore? 
the glory of Adam. He'll be clothed once again. His garments will be garments of righteousness. What's happening at the transfiguration? That's exactly what the transfiguration is showing us, at least in this theological view. It shows us many things. But at least in this one, Jesus was sinless, yes, and he restores the glory that Adam had lost. Okay, if Jesus is the Messiah, then he is supposed to be the one to restore the glory of Adam, and he does. And let me show you, it comes, it's in the rabbinic writings. Okay, this is a writing called Numbers Rabbah. This is commenting on the book of Numbers. And it first says this. So what they're talking about is what was taken from Adam when he sinned in the garden. And the very first thing they said, the following things were taken from Adam. His luster. His light. He was no longer reflecting God's glory. But then it goes on to say this about what's going to happen in the days of the Messiah. Okay? So it says, how can we infer that the above things are to be restored in the days of the Messiah? His luster we can infer from the text, but may all who love you be like the sun when it rises in its strength. And that's what they're doing is using the text from Judges 5.31. But look at their idea. The idea is Adam loses the glory, and when the Messiah comes, he's going to restore the glory of Adam. It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant, and it's exactly what Jesus is doing. And then, if we go back to Paul, because, you know, Paul, he's fully aware of these ideas, and then Paul's going to say, okay, now that the Messiah is here, here's what you need to do. This is 2 Corinthians 3.18. We looked at this a couple weeks ago. And he says, but we all who with unveiled faces mirror or reflect God's glory, yes, we mirror or reflect God's glory, and we are being transformed, and what we talked about a, uh, two weeks ago, transformed, metamorphu, is the same word used for transfigured. We're being transformed, transfigured into his image with ever increasing glory. It's a process over time. Whereas you transfigure as a Christian through the power of the Holy Spirit, that slowly but surely you ever increasingly reflect the glory of God into the world. Now, is it your own personal glory? No, which comes from the Lord, who's the Spirit. You can't do it on your own. You're not the sun radiating the light. You're the moon who reflects the light into the darkness. That's what you're supposed to do as a Christian. Increase your, the glory of God radiating off of you into the world. And it brings light to the world in ways that the world, one, doesn't understand and two, hates. Which is why people are persecuted. So, this is what Paul wants us to do. He understands this metaphor of the first Adam, last Adam, and that at the core of this is that they're beings of light. That when Adam was first there, had he not sinned, would just reflect the glory of God into the world. Okay. So what is this beings of light business? What's this all about? And so what I want to do is show you something from the Hebrew, because um, well, Hebrew is so rich, and, and we're such, at such a disadvantage when we read our Bible in English, and I, and I hate to say that, but it's, you know, every Hebrew teacher will tell you you're missing something when we, when we read it in English. We always lose something. And this is one of those things when it comes to this idea right here. So let me show you something, because this is really cool, and the rabbis love, love to play with things like this. I'm going to show you the Hebrew word for light, okay? In the beginning, where God said, let there be light, that's Genesis, in Genesis 1. And then the Hebrew word for skin, very first time it shows up, God made them garments of skin, okay? That's Genesis 3. In Hebrew, the word for light is pronounced or. It's spelled like this. For those of you who, who want to follow along, it's, the letters are Aleph, Vav, and Resh. Of course, they read from right to left rather than left to right. Okay? That's for light. Or. 
The word skin in Hebrew is pronounced or. Did you get that? So in Hebrew, you pronounce skin or the same as, same as light, except it's spelled a little bit different. In this case, it's spelled Hebrew has two A letters, and they're both silent, so they take on the sounding of the vowel that's next to them. So that's where you get or. And this is ayin vav resh. Now look at that. There's something connected. Skin, or the garments, or what garments of skin that they put on Adam and Eve, is somehow connected in a very mysterious way to light. All right, so let me show you something. So light in Hebrew starts with this letter right here, Aleph. This is an Aleph. And the Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And that letter uh, represents strength and it represents God. So if you just had Aleph, it's going to be a representation of God because the words Elohim start with an Aleph. The word Adonai starts with an Aleph. So it's light from God. Yes? Let there be light. God's emanating his light, or. Now let's go over to skin. The ayin right here, that's an ayin. That's how you say that letter in Hebrew. And this one is associated with an eye, right? The word for eye or a spring. The rabbis love to play with this because they sound exactly the same. You could very easily switch a vowel, and the next thing you know, you go from light to skin or skin to light. So it looks like what's happening is they're covered, they're covered then in another form of light that can be seen by the eye. See, God's light is invisible, right? God's light's invisible. It's like the light of consciousness. You can't see it. You can't, we, you know, we don't have the instrumentation right now to detect it. But you know it's there, you can feel it spiritually when God's light or presence is there, but it's invisible. And then you go over to the skin, and just like Moses, even though God's light is invisible, it can radiate through your skin. Just like Moses's, the skin of his face, the ore of his face was generating light. And so there's this deep, mysterious connection going on here between the word light and the word for skin. So let me just show you where it comes from. It's Genesis 3.21. It says this, God made them garments of skin. Now notice what's happening here, the progression. Genesis 3.21. They exist. They were naked but had no shame. And then they sinned. Well, what changed when they suddenly knew they were naked? What fell off? God's glory. And so now, God made them garments of skin, which is or, for Adam and his wife, and clothed them, the Hebrew word or. And so here's what the rabbis do. They, they, they play with this. And let me show you from, I showed you this verse right here. This refers to Adam's garments, which were like a torch shedding radiance. That's from Genesis Rabbah 2012. But the, what, what it says right before it is this. They're commenting on this sent verse from Genesis. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin, or, and clothed them. Right? There's the verse. And now they're going to make a comment. And the comment's really cool. In Rabbi Mir's Torah, it was found written, garments of light, or. And they're playing with that. Okay? So just realize, without a doubt, you have, you have skin, or and light or, and they can be easily moved back and forth, right? And so there's some kind of very deep connection here. And because the skin is connected with the eye, and in this case, the word for spring, like Ein Gedi, is the word for spring, the spring of Gedi. Okay, and this is so cool because the Ein then is, is associated in some weird way with physical sight right? Is that all, though? Because the eye is like the spring 
to the soul, what pours out of the spring of your eye. Is it cool, refreshing water? Or is it bitterness, right? What does Jesus say about the eye? The eye. Jesus says this, this is Matthew 6, 22 to 23. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body is filled with light. Okay? But if your eyes are unhealthy, which that's an idea of generosity, your whole body is full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? This blows my mind. It's, it's almost so deep you can't even comprehend it, but it's like it's so cool to see this connection. God's light is unseen light. It's the light of consciousness. It's the deepest light there can be, but it pervades everything. It's unseen. You can't see it with your physical eyes, but you can perceive it with spiritual attunement. And ayin, because it's associated with eye, that's visible. That's the visible. And you can reflect God's glory into the world, just like the heavenly righteous. And the world will be aware of that light. Okay? So, beings of light? So here's some, let me, let me give you some thoughts just to, to try to bring this some closure to this. Beings of light, it's a very powerful thing to think about. First of all, when we see this, the idea of beings of light and the transfiguration, you say, Jesus is the last Adam. He's the one who restores the glory that Adam lost, right? Adam is in the garden. He sins. The glory goes away. Jesus then transfigures. It's up on the mountain. They're able to see. There's a revealing that happens. And Jesus was able to accomplish what the first Adam could not, and therefore the glory was restored. Sin causes the loss of God's glory to reflect into the world. There's a whole lot more in the New Testament that can be brought into this category of first Adam and last Adam. It's, it's a very sophisticated way of communicating, probably more sophisticated than most of us can imagine. But when you see it, it jumps out at you to say, that's who Jesus is. The second thing is that at the core of our being, remember, because we're all descended from Adam and Eve, yes, in our sinful nature, but Paul says, in your physical nature, you are just like Adam, the first Adam, but in your in your spiritual nature, you're just like the last Adam. And the core of our being is light. So the human being, and this is according to the Bible, is comprised of body, that's the physical part we see, but we're also mind, spirit, soul. Now there's confusion, of course, between the difference between soul and spirit. You are comprised of things that you cannot measure and you cannot see with your physical eyes, but we can sense with our spiritual sense. So the spiritual aspect of us interacts with God. It exists beyond this physical life, and it can reflect the glory of God into the darkness of the world. So when you leave this physical body, all of you that is, we can't measure nor see right now um, goes with you into the afterlife. And then in the afterlife, of course, you will be clothed as the heavenly righteous, clothed in God's glory. Now, the thing is, we can't see or right now perceive God, God's light through our physical senses. But this is why the transfiguration or even the book of Revelation or the book of Enoch that's why they are apocalyptic. They're revelations. They're revealing the true nature of reality that human beings can't perceive on a daily basis. And I think this is why Mark's gospel, which we'll get to, has a progression of seeing and hearing who Jesus is. As the disciples grow with Jesus, they have a new awareness. They're ascending the mountain. They see with near, new eyes. And this is why the kingdom of God comes through seeing and hearing. It's perceiving the reality, even though physically you can't, it's not there, but you do perceive that it's, a, that it's available. What's cool about this, oh, by the way, if you want to say, wait a minute, is our core of our being is light. 
Yeah, it's even being proven by science. And this is one of the coolest things right now. Um, okay, then let me show you a couple places. The first one I would, I would have you read or, or consider reading is a book by um, Gerald Schroeder. And it's called The Hidden Face of God, Science Reveals the Ultimate Truth. And this book, he goes into, he also wrote a book called The Science of God, but goes into the nature of what scientists are now discovering, and this is in the realm of particle physics or at the subatomic level or quantum uh, mechanics, is they're discovering that the nature, nature of reality uh, of the universe is far different than we think. So, The Hidden Face of God, that's an a, a excellent book. So, the second book is, again, this is, this is at an introductory level, The Physics of God. This is by a, an author, Joseph Selby. And what's cool about these is they come to this conclusion that at the core of our being is energy or light. That we can't, we, we, don't, have the, we don't have the tools to measure it right now. We don't have the... Uh, we don't have the language to fully understand it, but it appears that that's the reality of who we are, and it would be the, it would be the height of divine irony, right? If, and I think this is going to happen one day. Science is going to prove the reality of God, right? Now, can you imagine that? The, the group that has said, that denied the existence of God because they couldn't prove it, I think are getting closer and closer to understanding that there's a spiritual nature to the entire universe. And we would obviously call that God. But the point is, this is very cool that even science is predicting or at least showing us that at the core of our being is something that we don't fully understand and is a, is a type of light. And that's what the Bible says. Okay. And we have to remember, we're all descendants of Adam, the first Adam. We share as a part of his nature. And this is what the Bible tells us. And definitely the New Testament is that you can increase in Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, increase that glory right now in this life. That's part of the point, right? So when Paul says here, as we just read, you are to mirror or reflect God's glory, and you are to be transformed into his image with increasing glory, meaning over time, that's the point of it, okay? He even says in 1 Corinthians 15 that we read earlier, he says, And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. And so we, reflect, we in Jesus, begin to reflect the glory of God, the glory that was lost when Adam sinned. Okay? Now, so part of this message, and it's so important, I think, is part of developing as a Christian, as maturing as a Christian. It isn't just to go to church on Sunday and call it good, but that you're supposed to have a transforming life and be transfigured into the image of the heavenly man in the present. Don't wait till later. And we begin then to reflect God's glory into the world today. The world needs light, not physical light, but the light of God reflected into the world. And Christians are supposed to be the one to reflect the, that light of God into the darkness of the world. That's what we do. Increase your light into the world. The goal is to be transformed, increasingly being able to reflect God's glory. So, one last note on beings of light, because I want to just show you one more scientific piece of this. Is there something about human beings that, uh, that have to do with light? Well, check out this uh, news article. This is from 2009. Humans glow in visible light. The human body literally glows, emitting a visible light in extremely small quantities at levels that rise and fall within the day. And so scientists in Japan, using special cameras, in a completely dark room, then take pictures of human beings, and what do they see? That human beings are emitting light. At our core is the being is a is a light being. I like this one, the way that they wrote the headline. Strange, right? <laughs> Looks like this. Strange. Humans glow in visible light. Really? Strange. 
to the modern world, yes? But if you read an ancient book called the Bible, it's not all that strange if we can understand what our Bible is saying. Now, one thing I'd have you consider, think about the way we even use the word light. His face lit up. You can see, you can at least detect, not see visibly, but you can detect light in a person. And I, I know that many of you, you've, you've met a godly man or a godly woman, that when you're with them, there's something uh, is reflecting out of them. It's a light. They, bring, they truly are a light to the world. And, uh, you know, we use the phrase, she lit the room up. I think somewhere very deep inside of us, we understand this nature of light and darkness within a human being, especially darkness. If you bump into darkness, you know it right away. It's, 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 it's alarming. So, okay. So we go back to this. It's, so the, the Bible is far deeper about the nature of reality than we can often imagine. And it's really, it's stunning. And I, and I hope that this can provide at least a little slice of that. I, you know, we're always limited by time and allowing people to develop over, uh, through the course of, of learning, you, you, you develop the understanding, right? So if you, this is the first time you've heard this, you might say, what is he talking about? But I know that over time, these grow stronger and stronger and stronger. And part of that is the Hebrew is a very dynamic language. And those sages of Israel believe that every single word, every letter in Hebrew was from God, and that it was there to help them understand God's plan, right? So you can play with words like or and or and talk about light. And unfortunately, you know, again, not to be a, a, a downer, but we lose something when we translate into English or we've forgotten the uh, ancient ways of reading the Bible. So beings of light, that's what we're wondering. Part of that story is that Jesus is the second Adam. And then Paul says, now you go do the same thing in Christ Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Start reflecting God's glory into the world.